and established by university. And I was asked what women I could talk about. And really the kind of clinical problem I face, um, which is a real puzzle out in Ethiopia, is leishmaniasis, which is one of the neglected tropical diseases, and how to treat it, and, and, um, and what it is. So really I just want to, I suppose, show you what I see there, and um, put to you the questions that I face and which I can't answer. And, um, uh, really, and the opposite end of Francesca's talk, she had a problem, is the problem there, how do you deal with it, how big is the problem, how do you approach it, what do you do, do it, follow it, fantastic. I looked at that and thought, I want to be there, but I'm not, I'm, I'm the other end. So, um, uh, leishmaniasis, very common disease worldwide, I mean, I'm a dermatologist, I look at cutaneous leishmaniasis, but there's also a visceral form, um, calories are, so there's le leishmania parasites, there's, there's more than 20 worldwide, um, and it's the parasites that cause the disease. And um, they are, and in Ethiopia, the one we have is Leishmania ethiopica, which makes it easy to remember. Um, and they're transmitted by sandflies, and there's various different, two main types of sandflies that do this. Um, and the clinical forms of disease you get are cutaneous leishmaniasis, which is uh, pretty common, um, visceral leishmaniasis, which is um, fatal or can be fatal, and, um, and then the mucocutaneous form, which is really a complication of cutaneous disease, which can be very destructive, life-destroying, and fatal. So these are the, um, the sort of things we see. So it, it's a worldwide condition. I mean, it's actually spreading as the world gets warmer. And I suppose what almost grabs its attention in Europe is it used to be seen around the Mediterranean littoral, and they're French, they don't count. But actually, it's sort of spreading up from the Med, um, spreading from Spain, spreading up into, into European countries, those forms of it. But really it's found in the, the warmer parts of the world, extensively in, I suppose, sub-Saharan Africa, um, uh, the, the Latin America, um, Central America, um, and across to India. And there's, um, there's about a million cases. It is said that there are about a million cases of cutaneous leishmaniasis each year, according to WHO. But of course, what I see in Ethiopia is what comes to um, the hospital I work in, um, in Addis. So probably people come to us for about two or three days' journey, so, you know, a few hundred miles. But who knows what's happening out in the country? So, you know, those figures are, are real guesses, and that's one of the problems. And the deaths from visceral, visceral leishmaniasis are tw uh, 20 or 30,000 a year. But in terms of disability-adjusted life years, um, the toll is much higher, because mucocutaneous leishmaniasis, as you'll see, um, is a debilitating disease. Now, I see it in Britain too. Um, basically, if um, in an exam um, in British dermatology, there's a chap with a very short haircut and a non-healing ulcer, um, he's a soldier, um, and he's been to Afghanistan, or he's been to Belize, and he's got cutaneous leishmaniasis, and that's what we see. And um, so, uh, to two short haircut, cutaneous leishmaniasis. That's a diagnosis, whatever the lack of a rash looks like. <laughs> and of course, and, um, of course, they get a very localized disease. We jump in with every bit of treatment. So what's fascinating is the same parasite in a healthy British soldier, or I might say with some of your students that I have seen in the past from who've been doing field work um, in sort of warm parts of the world and have crossed my clinic with, with this. And they get very localized disease, and we leap in with these um, systemic drugs, these pentavalent antimonies, whatever the degree of it, you know, we whack it really hard, and they get better. And it's not a problem for them. Um, but in Ethiopia, um, the sort of pattern I see uh, can be similar, but we also see um, quite a lot of variation. In fact, so I, I work at um, ALERT, which is the African Leprosy and TB Research Institute in Addis Ababa. I'm um, also up in Gonda. And Ethiopia at the moment, you know, it's got this rapidly growing economy, 10% a year. They're extending um, higher education, a big, a core part of government's drive um, for development to, is to increase higher education. So having they've gone from three universities 15 years ago, there are now 30. And what we're doing is we have to, and those universities have medical schools. And what we're doing in, um, in Addis is we're trying to train, there were five dermatologists for 80 million people um, 15 years ago. We're now up to one in each of the medical schools because there's lots of leprosy, cutaneous TB, and all the kind of diseases are out there, but you need the, the trained doctors to deal with it. So what we're doing in Addis is we're concentrating on trying to ensure the training is of a high standard, arrange placements over here to get some kind of refinement to your training, um, and then 
these dermatologists then head out to the new medical schools. And I, and I see the dermatology they see. And um, oh, this is Alert, which is the, um, where I go each year, All Africa Leprosy Rehabilitation Training Center. Lovely compound, Edribadis, fantastic residents, just enthusiastic, able, a, a real pleasure to teach. Um, and the kind of the usual sort of waiting room of people who've, walk, who've walked or got buses in for an often several days' journey. Now, the, the sort of classic uh, ordinary cutaneous leishmaniasis is, is, is this cutaneous form, which will heal by itself. You're bitten by a sandfly, so it's going to be exposed skin. It's often children, because sandflies fly around at quite a low level, and children move around at quite a low level. Um, and you're bitten, um, and you... Uh, Get a, and and, and the, the, the promastigates are put in there, a couple of mastigates inside, and, um, and you get a nodule there, which generally um, will heal. Now, you don't actually eradicate the infection because they sit in the macrophages, but you just control the infection, um, and you, it'll scar. It generally heals with scarring, but it settles down. Um, you can also get it on the somebody on a forearm, a much more kind of meaty lesion, which will heal, leaving a scar there but will heal, and it will give you a degree of immunity. Um, what can happen in some people, and again, the books, actually, the, the textbooks, even the WHO literature, never quite matches up with what I actually see there. So um, disseminated cutaneous leishmaniasis, according to the textbooks, is mostly seen in Central America and doesn't happen with Ethiopia, where I see it in Ethiopia, but absolutely we see it. So what happens is... Here, there appears to be a failure of cell-mediated immunity. Um, and later on, um, some time often after your little nodule of leash, um, you'll get very much more extensive disease with masses of parasites in there. Um, and it progresses, it extends, and it continues. Um, and it really doesn't respond very well to the treatment, the tr which I shall mention in a, in a minute. So, you know, classically it said... Um, not to ulcerate, unlike the cutaneous leishmaniasis. But you get these very tumid lesions. I mean, I think of it as being slightly analogous to Lepromatous leprosy, you know, uh, parasite-rich, or in that case, bacterial-rich um, skin, laden with infection um, due to a failure of CMI. And although it's said not to ulcerate, actually, if it gets bad enough, um, you will get ulceration um, over, over, over joints and so on. And you can get secondary infection... Um, you know, cellulitis, death, you know, complications like that. So it's a pretty unpleasant thing to do. And I have no idea, we, no one has an idea, who's going to go on from an uncomplicated cutaneous leishmaniasis to someone who's going to develop the, the progressive disseminated leishmaniasis. I've got no idea who's going to get it and why. Um, and again, here's somebody else with really quite sort of these fixed kind of con developed contractures in the, in the fingers. The other really nasty form, um, and again, the, the books say this doesn't happen with Ethiopia, but we do see it, and um, this is supposed to happen particularly down in India and so on, is the mucocutaneous leishmaniasis, and here's a really nasty one. So you have the parasite. As, as I said, you don't get the parasite load, but what happens in later years um, is it starts to invade the mucosa and destroy it. So initially, class, here's a girl in, I think she was in Gonda, um, uh, you initially you get just sort of involvement around the tip of the nose. But what then happens with time um, is it moves on from these little papules on the nose to actually move up into the nasopharynx and destroy the inside of the nose. Um, and then it actually moves down to the pharynx um, where, and, and, and you die. Um, so uh, a, a really nasty complication of cutaneous leishmaniasis. Well, the tr so how do you treat this? Well, um, and that's really where the kind of um, evidence base really fails. Uh, I remember when I was a junior doctor 25 years ago, and although it's not a huge amount, it doesn't seem to everyone go, it was a different world in terms of medical treatment. I can remember as a medical SHO, there was a kind of machismo about treatment. And um, you know, one, some of my fellow SHOs would wander around with swan gants catheters. You know, someone's got heart failure, I'm going to swan gants them. There was no idea then that if a doctor was to do something, they should be trained and competent. It was a kind of machine where the books say this is what you do. And actually there was no, there were none of the kind of guidelines we had. There was no evidence-based medicine. There were kind of junior doctors alone running hospitals in those days. And in the doctor's mess, oh, so-and-so, you know, pop in the central, I did a bit. We'd kind of seen one, we'd maybe done one. Um, we weren't necessarily competent to do it. So there wasn't a kind of, uh, 
a meta-analysis of who needs this, who doesn't. And my memories of being a junior doctor, actually, were a kind of fear of, you know, you've been to medical school and taught some stuff, and there's some papers written, but is that a good paper? Is it a bad paper? Did somebody find something different? There were no sort of guidelines. Yes, your consultant was on this telephone, but, you know, there's only one, and he's going to be up the next morning, and we should run it. And it was a different world. Now, we, we have, you know, you have to be com confident. It's a horrible world, but you have to be confident before you do something. We have evidence-based medicine. Does this intervention save lives, or does it not save lives? What are the risk benefit issues? We have all of that, and it's fantastic. And I, actually, I realized that my feelings of fear and inadequacy as a junior doctor were correct. <laughs> and actually, me not having the balls to do what some of my colleagues did, and I'm going to say colleagues, was actually, you know, good, responsible medicine. <laughs> Even I shouldn't have. <laughs> but I sit here, I sit here, and, 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 and I realize um, that actually, it's the same situation I was in here 25 years ago as a junior doctor, that I don't have the evidence base to know what to give my treatments. So, um, as I said, most cutaneous species analysis gets better by itself. You're left with an ulcer and that's it. But um, some of them don't. You know, some of them go on to new cutaneous. So, and, and kidneys, some of them come to disseminate cutaneous. Who's, who's that going to happen to? I really don't know. How aggressively should I be treating them? So you, can, so you can do nothing, it's going to self-heal. And probably, I mean, I see a fraction of the leash analysis in Ethiopia, because most of it doesn't come to a primary healthcare worker in a, in a critical clinic, let alone a nurse, you know, let alone um, a nurse um, in Addis Ababa. Um, local wound care makes a lot of sense because you want to stop secondary infection. You know, so just keep it clean so you don't get a bacterial superinfection. Um, do you give intralesial? So the, the pentavalent antimony is safe in surviving leukinate. It's been around since the 1950s. Do you inject that into the lesion, which we do? You know, it's a local in infection. You can, you can freeze the things. You can heat the things. You, know, you can either freeze it, if you've got access to a freezing solution like liquid nitrogen, or you can have this thermotherapy where you heat it up. Seems to work. No really good trials comparing them. Um, or else you can give systemic antimonials. So what we do here is we give systemic to our our soldiers, we give systemic antimonials. We have a bunch of Gurkhas who um, had got uh, cutaneous species analysis on exercise, I think it was about 15 years ago. The Gurkhas, the toughest, the strongest of the strong. So they came into wards with their injections of um, pentavalent antimony. And of the 12 of them, six fainted at the sight of a needle. <laughs> and I can remember this sort of powerful sort of thing. However, the systemic antimonies, um, we don't know how effective they are. We don't know who's going to progress. Um, we don't know if they are going to progress, how effective these treatments are at preventing them from progressing. There's then side effects to these drugs. They cause cardiac side effects. When we give them to treatment here, you have to do cardiac monitoring to make sure they don't get arrhythmia. We, we don't have the machine um, in Addis to do that. So we don't know how dangerous the treatments are. We don't know how effective they are. Um, we don't know who needs it to prevent them progressing to further disease. So there's kind of guidelines laid out in WHO documents, although it admits that they don't have any information for Ethiopia, so that's slightly guesswork. So in Addis, one of my colleagues there has drawn up some sensible best guess. You know, it's like the evidence level, you know, A is meta-analysis, B down to E, which is two professors in a pub saying, what do you think? And we're kind of down at E. Um, these sort of guidelines for what seem to make sense, like, you know, crossing a joint, you know, several lesions, um, but we really lack that information. And I suppose, um, really, what I'm saying is I don't know the risk-benefit ratio for treatments. Um, I don't know the natural history of the disease. Um, I don't know the epidemiology of how common the disease is. Um, rock hyraxes um, are the other proof for it in Ethiopia. In Ethiopia, now, are we best treating vaccinated rock hyraxes? They try and remove them from villages, but not very successfully. Um, and we don't know the comparative efficacy of the treatments for us. So I've watched some great presentations about full of data and knowledge and science and success. And I suppose I just sit here at the kind of, in the clinics in Ethiopia, and I say I go there and teach. I learn far more from my residents than I teach. And this is something though I feel just sort of inadequate to cope with. And I would, I would love, um, I suppose some of these questions to be answered. What's the worst I can imagine? So I think that's really the